The question for Johnson is whether he can hitch himself to those who have a broader ideological objection to Sunak, which is very much the uh, illiberal uh, nationalist and protectionist side of what was the concert, the combination that gave us Brexit, uh, which, as I said, is, I think, now on the up and is seen, obviously, in the concerns of those red wall conservatives um, who fear that they are going to lose their seats. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and I'll be speaking today in our video, our Federal Trust video, about the destructive and disruptive effects of Brexit, specifically on the Conservative Party. I'll be talking about this very, very contemporary topic uh, with John Stevens, the um, chair of the Federal Trust. Um, John, during the referendum campaign of 2016, a, a lot of people warned about the economic damage and disruption that Brexit would cause. Uh, and essentially, we're seeing that those warnings uh, were justified. People talked, I think, a bit less about the political fallout from Brexit and particularly less about the uh, political fallout for the Conservative Party. Um, do you think in retrospect it was inevitable that Brexit should have been as disruptive and um, divisive an issue for the Conservative Party as it's turned out to be over the past seven years? Well, I think so. I mean, first, because the Conservative Party has made itself the party of Brexit. Brexit is its dominant policy to which everything else is tied. And if Brexit fails, as it is failing, uh, that will, in my view, bring down the Conservative Party. Uh, because the arguments for Brexit, the, the way in which it was pitched to two very different audiences, in fact, um, to a an anti-establishment, anti-wealth, uh, anti-London audience on one hand, and to a internationalist, uh, globalist, economic, liberal uh, audience, on the other hand, um, is completely incompatible. And that uh, combination is tearing at what was always a compromise in conservative politics between capitalist economics and a sense of nationhood, a sense of identity, and, and uh, a sense of patriotism. And these two elements in the Conservative coalition have been blasted apart by the failure of Brexit. What would you say is that the balance of forces at the moment between those two tendencies within the Conservative Party, which of them holds the upper hand? Oh, I think that the, the nationalist um, protectionist uh, agenda is on the up now. Um, that's partly because of the, the failures of the attempt at uh, a Singapore on Thames style economic liberalism under uh, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. But above all, it's because of the way in which the post-Brexit economy um, has become increasingly dependent on immigration uh, and immigration from outside uh, Europe. And this is likely to uh, lead to a great deal of protest from the national side of the of the coalition, and and that's where I think the uh, the, the tension and the potential trouble uh, for this government, indeed for the country, um, is likely to come. There's a, a particularly public and uh, vicious. Uh... Uh, element to the uh, um, civil war, if you like, within the Conservative Party at the moment, um, that between Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. Um, do you think that's um, personal or, or is it political and ideological? And if it is ideological, where do you um, position the two of them uh, in the map of the Conservative Party you've just been setting out? Well, I think when it comes to Boris Johnson, everything is personal. Uh, so this is, in, in the first instance, uh, his anger, his rage at having been removed from office by Rishi Sunak, because there's no question that it was it was Sunak's resignation which was really uh, the 
the, the peak of of what brought down Johnson. Uh, and if he if he'd remained uh, loyal, I think it is possible to argue that Johnson might have survived that particular crisis. I think something else would have then probably have gone wrong. But nevertheless, I think Johnson does feel, and he's probably right about this, that Sunak is the man responsible for his departure from Number Ten Downing Street, and he wants a revenge essentially. Um, the question for Johnson is whether he can hitch himself to those who have a broader ideological objection to Sunak, which is very much the uh, illiberal uh, nationalist and protectionist side of what was the concert, the combination that gave us Brexit, uh, which, as I said, is, I think, now on the up and is seen, obviously, in the concerns of those red wall conservatives um, who fear that they are going to lose their seats, and also in beyond the Conservative Party, in uh, the ranks of the what was the Brexit Party reform and and uh, and the rest. And so I think um, the question for Johnson is whether he can ally himself with those groups, and perhaps it boils down to, in particular, whether he can forge some form of political alliance or relationship with Nigel Farage um, or not. That's really what I think. Yes. Can, can we talk about that in more detail later? But I'd like just to dwell on where Sunak um, stands in this um, uh, this ideological uh, landscape of the Conservative Party, uh, and particularly in his views of Europe. Uh, he's presented as himself as being a, a pragmatist, somebody who can have a, a, a better relationship with the European Union. Um, uh, he's very much more uh, a credentialed Brexiter even than Johnson. He's always been in favour of leaving the European Union. Um, where where does this slightly um, um, amorphous um, person um, stand in, in, in the internal conflicts of the Conservative Party, do you think? Well, he has a very curious position because, as you say, he is a convinced uh, anti-European. Uh, his whole uh, background is uh, is antagonistic, I would say, fundamentally to Europe, a combination of uh, his fascination for um, Silicon Valley and, and the American-style economy, um, his his background, his outlook has always been um, one that, well, Europe has really no place. Uh, on the other hand, he does realise that uh, the hardline approach uh, that Truss epitomised of going all out for what undoubtedly he believes is fundamentally an economically liberal um, deregulation, low tax agenda is simply not deliverable at the moment. And so he is very much in survival mode of trying to restore some economic credibility to the government. But it's firefighting. I mean, he has no place or, or time uh, for um, ideological considerations that go beyond, well, really ne next week. Uh, and we see this in the way in which the economy is being managed really on this short-term basis, uh, and in particular reacting to the, the rise in inflation in, in, in a manner that is uh, simply firefighting. It's not really looking at the fundamentals. There, there is a belief among some of um, Sunak supporters, uh, particularly the, the remaining um, handful of pro-EU conservative MPs, um, that he will be able to ensure over the next 18 months, if he lasts that long, uh, a more harmonious and more productive relationship with the European Union. Um, there have been things said by the European Commission this week, which um, suggests that there are limitations on how far that can go. Um, how, how do you see that? How do you think the relationship with the European Union will go over the next 18 months under, under Sunak's premiership? Well, I, I don't think this is really going to uh, amount to very much. I mean, it is possible that um, the arrangements that he's made over Northern Ireland um, lead to a certain degree of stability. But even that is not clear at the moment, because until we see what the Democratic Unionist Party decides to do over uh, 
over Stormont, it, it's certainly too early to tell whether uh, the Windsor framework that uh, Sunak has created, which is the basis for his somewhat improved uh, position vis-a-vis the European Union, uh, actually stands the test of time. But more fundamentally, there's no real um, opportunity for altering uh, the relationship that currently prevails uh, between the UK and the and the EU. Um, S- Sunak is is really simply trying to ensure that uh, the defeat that is coming at the hands of the Labour Party, the next general election, is not too grave. And this is why the erstwhile pro-Europeans, if that's the right way of describing them, the moderate elements in, in, that remain, such as they are, in the Conservative Party, are um, following his banner at the moment because they see that the um, danger is that following an election defeat, the Conservative Party will move even more strongly to the right, um, that the forces that are currently outside the Conservative Party in reform and and elsewhere um, will then be brought on board um, and that they will be further eclipsed um, and so Sunak is a sort of lifeboat for moderate conservatism at the moment. The hope is that um, he will uh, manage to achieve a sufficient success at the next general election for moderate conservatism to survive and not be consumed by a further lurch in the direction of extremism. Does Johnson have, coming back to um, what you were mentioning earlier in in, in your remarks, uh, uh, a strategy? May he, uh, as it were, tumble into a strategy? Perhaps he doesn't have a strategy at the moment, but in two or three months' time, he might have a strategy. Um, how plausible do you think it is that he could be part uh, of what you've described as a, uh, a hard right, a hard Brexit, um, right-wing coalition which wouldn't necessarily be the Conservative Party, but might be. Um, how, how do you see that as as playing out? And what do you think Johnson's position is on that at the moment? Well, those who think this won't happen point out that Johnson is in a very comfortable position. He's, uh, um, he's going to make quite a lot of money. Um, there's no hurry because the expectation is that the Conservatives will lose the next election, that Johnson is not interested in leading a Conservative Party in opposition, um, that he's too lazy for all of this. I think that analysis misses the intense rage, which clearly consumes him, uh, about uh, his departure from Number 10, his uh, fear of where his reputation currently stands, and his desire for vengeance. And this, I think, may allow him to fall into, as you say, some form of cooperative arrangement with uh, Nigel Farage and, and, and others to inflict a monumental defeat on the Conservative Party. I don't think it is in the um, uh, realms of possibility for uh, any uh, non-Conservative force, reform or whatever, um, to win any seats in the next general election. But I do feel that they have the capacity Mm. to turn what might otherwise be a relatively modest defeat, which is clearly what the Conservative moderates are hoping for in their support of Sunak, into a disaster that would deliver the Conservative Party into the arms of a much more extreme right-wing agenda. So you think there might be an initiative... um either formal or informal, by Johnson between now and the next general election? Or or can you imagine his hoping, continuing to hope, to stand as a, a Conservative candidate at the next election? No, I can't see that happening. And I think a lot of effort is, is clearly going to be made by Sunak and by the Conservative establishment to ensure that he cannot run as a candidate at the next general election. I think he's more interested in ensuring that the... Uh, next general election is a disaster for Sunak and a disaster for moderate conservatism. And the way that might be achieved, I think, is by um, some form of ad hoc coalition of a number of elements. Um, Reform would be one. Um, Lawrence Fox's um, outfit might be another. And it's quite interesting that 
uh, reform has decided to stand down in favor of Fox running in Uxbridge. Um, and Johnson might create some third element of that. And so you would get um, a loose recreation of the coalition that operated in the 2016 referendum, which where you had a number of voices, which in some respects were completely inconsistent one with the other, but nevertheless were all contributing to the victory of the Leave campaign. And so a insurgency where there were anti-conservative uh, right-wing candidates running at the next generation in a number of seats, perhaps particularly in the Red Wall. Um, that, I think, could be created. And I think that is what probably the people around Johnson, I'm thinking of Lord Cruddus in particular, um, have in mind. Um, and the question is whether that can be made to work and whether that would be credible. Um, but it, if it were to be established to any degree, the capacity to inflict damage on the Conservative Party is very great. Finally, um, the Labour Party's um, approach to all this um, seems to be ill-disguised Ill glee, but not much more. Um, is there a more active um, role that they could or should be taking, or, or are they playing their cards, their political cards, right in, in essentially just watching the Conservative Party pulling itself apart? Well, that I think is is what they're likely to do. Um, but of course, the more this sort of uh, anti-Sunak operation uh, gets traction, the greater the prospect is that the Labour Party will win a significant victory. And this opens up the opportunity for them to be much bolder on substantial areas of policy, above all on Brexit and not reversing Brexit and moving off the currently ludicrous position which they have of saying that they want to make Brexit work um, and enter the territory of actually working out how Brexit could be reversed. Um, but as I say, I don't think they are likely to take that opportunity, unfortunately, but unquestionably that opportunity will arise. Well, it looks as if um, Boris Johnson, as so often in recent British politics, may have almost by default uh, a central role to play in the development of British politics over the next 18 months. Um, will he, won't he, can he, can't he? The Federal Trust will keep you posted. John, thank you very much indeed. And I hope that our, our listeners um, will look at uh, and listen to more of our, our videos uh, on the Federal Trust website. Goodbye and thank you.